right, as promised, we're delayed a week here, but we promised you Freddie Hudson. Freddie, you there? Yes, I am, Eric, and thanks for having me. I, I appreciate you having me on your show and just all the publicity we're getting, and it's just great to collaborate. And, I mean, let's just start back with the history. We've got you jogging this horse, and it seems to be on a different type of surface with some bushes in the back here. Okay, that is um, Dusty Brown's um, Hot Rod Pete, and uh, Chief Robbins um, owned the horse. And we did a, um, in 2017, or 2016, uh, there had a historical landmark ceremony at the uh, Earth Station, which uh, was the grounds for the, uh, where the top of the racetrack was, which was opened in um, 1908. And so, uh, the Copperfield, um, Mike Copperfield, had an the event there, and he was there. So basically, we brought that horse in to go on what used to be the track. And it's, uh, it's now a turf string. It's all turf, and it's a nursery. But on that, in that particular picture, um, Chief had given me the lines, and he said, he says, watch out for that metal plate. And I'm like, metal plate? And so I'm on this turf, and like, it's really rough. Uh, so I had to put one of my feet behind the stirrup so I wouldn't bounce that way, so I wouldn't fall out. And it's bouncing. I go over this hill, and on the other side of this hill is this metal plate that's about 20 feet widthwise and 40 feet long. And so I had to pull on the right line to avoid that. Now I'm heading straight towards the tree, and I had to pull on the left line so I don't hit the tree. And then I came around, and this is towards the finish line of what used to be that track. Wow. So, I mean, I guess let's begin. You, you've shown us a shot here from 1909 at Birth Station. You know, before we get into a little of the history, I guess, of the 1970s with Styles Major and, you know, a lot of the international races you were involved with, um, I guess what, I guess, where, what's your beginning, I guess, in the sport? What generation are you, I guess, on both sides, if possible? We you know your father is multi generational. Okay, I, I'm a third, um, third, third generation. My grandfather raised and trained horses. My father raised and trained horses. Um, I started out as a kid. So I, if you ask me what year, I have no clue. And I have no, yeah, I remember hot walking horses when I was maybe seven years old. And you had 90 degrees of going here, hot walking horses. So your father probably was raised in the barn. You were probably raised in the barn. You just don't have those early memories because, you know, you're probably flooded with so much information. And trying to be a normal kid at the same time. Do you feel like you have the natural gift of you know, being a horse person or being a, a, a trainer and specific, you know, specifically maybe as even a driver? Oh, absolutely. You know, I drove right in my first race at the age of, I guess it was 16 or 17. I won that race, by the way. And that was up in Monticello. Um, I, I don't know. I don't remember when I first trained my first horse. Uh, but as a kid, I was 15, 16 or 17, something like that. Uh, my dad used to send me up to Monticello every summer with like five or six horses that I was training on my own. And um, I, I remember one night, I was called, I had been about 14 or something like that. Um, I ended up paddocking four horses in one night at Monticello because uh, my dad had, 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 had promoted one of his rooms to a second trainer. And um, it, he fired all the rooms. And so when we got up there to Monticello, um, we had no grooms and four horses in the race. And so it was me. <laughs> so, <laughs> we ended up striking three of us. <laughs> but you just had the natural gift of being a horse person. You have this, that, it's, 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 still, it's still in your blood is what you're saying. It's just a natural gift. Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, I, I basically took this table over in 1973. Uh, at the end of 73, you have to be a uh, super factor trial, where, um, I don't talk about this one too often, but my dad was one of the drivers that was, um, indicted in the super factor trial. And so, it, uh, everything had to, um, end right at that day, and everything had to tra be transferred over into my name. And on the day, my first day as a trainer, I started the morning off with 15 horses, and by the end of the, by noon time, I was down to 10 horses. <laughs> but, um, and then, yeah, the only just started pulling the horses, and I won a bunch of races for me. 
And within the three months period, I went from, you know, 15 horses to none. And then, uh, Christy Mitchell uh, offered me 10 horses to take up the Monticello. I went up the Monticello with those 10 horses and did very well with them. And, uh, and then, you know, the Super Secret Trial, my dad was quit as he came back, but he never, he never had a stable again after that. Well, let's let, let's and, talk first before, you know, you get into the history in the mid-70s and, you know, building everything up and then, you know, moving around the industry in different positions, you know, we've got these shots here from 1970, and we love these little photos, these black okay. and white shots. Can you explain everything with Styles Major and everything yes. else with all these shots here? They're beautiful. Okay, Styles Major was the New Zealand representative for the uh, 1970 uh, Roosevelt Raceway International Shot. Um, Mike Tenda, who was, was one of my dad's owners, actually leased the horse from a guy named Norm Campbell, in, um, who was from New Zealand. And he leased the horse, and we brought the horse over about two months before the International, and we raced him one race in Monticello that he won, and I think he had him in two or three qualifiers, I don't remember, but he won both of those. And this was just to prep him for the International, and his um, New Zealand trainer, Clem Scott, came along with him. And um, the whole uh, uh, Rocky Piscano, uh, Linda Piscano was um, ex father father in law, was the groom uh, that was the second trainer for my dad at that time. And the you know, was major race really good, and he could have won that race had he had any luck getting out. Okay, it's the rest of it. And so, you know, let's jump, jump back into now the 70s. You're talking about your stable. You know, we got some shots of you jogging, I guess, later. Um, you know, you're over at yeah. Harold Beer's stable. I mean, you want to talk about some of those horses, that open pacer? And, yeah, uh, I had a very Harold Beer's stable uh, a few years back. And uh, one of my, a good friend of mine, Charlie Gumbeck, had his um, well, got 12 horses with him at that point. And so when I was there, you know, Harold had probably got zero degrees that day, and Harold threw me behind every horse that he could possibly look at because I don't think he wanted to go out on the track because it's too cold. <laughs> and uh, the one uh, charter, uh, she won the Super Bowl the next week at the Meadowlands. That's you on the inside with the with the yellow number. Yes. The final pad yes. yellow. Okay. Obviously, looking to put these things and try to win, and then put them to start and just—I mean, that's how it's done. The breeding, the breeding aspect, and what you're doing there—you know—you're saying here you're inspecting this horse, so they're entrusting you with the confirmation and the knowledge that you've had from three generations. I mean, can you explain that? shots here. We've got this shot here with uh, some of your partners currently with your show. If you want to talk about your show here for a second, and then obviously, sure, I guess with, um, I mean, who do you want to start with? Do you want to start with Trey or do you want to start with Bob? It's up to you. <laughs> okay, well, in, in these pictures over here, there's one picture down there. This was at the Bruce Roosevelt Raceway reunion, and you got Johnny Campbell, Trey Martin, 
I'm Gene Joe Wright, Bobby Rainer, and myself. And we're in that picture. We were actually waiting for um, Michael Chance to um, go up to the reunion there. And the person who took that picture was uh, Paul Gamble, um, Johnny's Johnny's wife. And the reunions, I think we've done one, two, three, four of them so far. And uh, we've had large turnouts. Uh, the first one that we did was in 2009. And they actually had to cancel the Hamiltonian party because all of the people who attended the Hamiltonian party switched over to our party or something. Wow. <laughs> wow. wanted to kill me on that one. <laughs> wow. So then let's talk about your relationship with Bob. We got the shot here just with the two of you. You know, you yeah. guys had started the show and he was going international and you were hitting milestones. Yeah, and, you know, we started the show. Uh, we're going to be doing our 100th show very soon. Uh, I think we're about 96 or 97 right now. And uh, Bob, uh, you know, it's been great. Uh, Bob likes to put questions together. Uh, Trey uh, does a lot of the editing, and Trey is just, like, fantastic to work with. Uh, Trey, yeah, most people don't know this, he's, he was nominated for 13 or 14 Grio Awards, wow. which Grio Awards are for doing commercials. Yep. And, you know, he's, he's a Grammy winner, and he's probably written, you know, thousands of songs. And a lot of, he's had a lot of hit songs. And at one time he was, uh, he did all the music for, uh, Pepsi. And he was under contract with Pepsi for, uh, several years. You're talking about like the jingles and stuff and the commercials and stuff like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think he had a million dollar a year contract with wow. Pepsi. And that was, that was back in the early 70s. Wow. And that, that's where I first met Trey. I met Trey in the early 70s. And I met him at Joe Rico Sr.'s Italian restaurant. Uh, Joe, Joe Rico Jr., who is George Brennan's um, stepfather, um, is Joe, Joe's father at an Italian restaurant in Monticello. And Trey was doing a benefit there to raise money for, I believe it was Preston Burris's daughter, who was about 10 years old or something to that effect, who um, had cancer or something to that effect. I don't remember all the details of it a long time ago. But Trey was the performer. And he did a non-stop um, performance issue. And that was when I first met him. <laughs> so, you know, they say, you know, Stanford Racing is all about relationships. It's very family-oriented. Let's just delve right in. we got a couple of shots here of you um, doing some public speaking. Let's talk first yes. about here, I guess, not at D.C. yet, but you're over at Rose Park Raceway. I mean, you're expanding outside of, I guess, your boundaries here, and you're talking at a different racetrack. I actually act as the spokesperson for the Standard Break Retirement Foundation, and I was speaking on their behalf to the uh, Maryland, um, the Maryland Horse Racing Council. They were having a meeting at the uh, Rose Grove Raceway, and I spoke there. That's where that picture was taken. There's another picture of me speaking at the Capitol, um, and this one was in front of the FDA building. And I was speaking on behalf of the uh, Indian Horse Water for in, in promotion of the state tax. And I speak on behalf of the you know, Standard of Retirement Foundation in our industry to end horse water. So so then we've horse got horse the shot water. here of you outside at the Canada building. And what's going on here now? Um, okay. The, uh, I have one picture over there with, um, I'm with um, Nancy Curry. And that was after the hearing, and that was in front of the hearing room. She had just testified um, in favor of the um, SAFE Act. So that's Nancy Perry of the ASPCA. Is she the president? No, or? Correct. Correct. Yes, she's a, I think she's the vice president, and she's one of the top lobbyists. Wow. Wow. And, and there's the other one, and then there's another picture of us at the uh, Senator Warren's office and I'm with Valerie Pringle in that picture. And Valerie is the uh, top um, lobbyist for the you know, Humane Society. And I've attended a bunch of meetings with her. And uh, that's the one, if you, if you see the woman with the yellow jacket, um, Valerie is the person next to her. In, and the staffer from uh, Senator Warren's office is the other person that I still remember who the person is in the yellow jacket. And then you've got this shot here with a bunch of people with Michelle in the middle. Correct. Okay, that one is uh, Susan Harrison, 
is with me and uh, myself, uh, Michelle Gaudrick, and Danny Kazemeyer. And that is at one of the Senate buildings, and we're there lobbying that day for both of those. So you're now taking your knowledge, your intrinsic knowledge throughout the years, you're taking just your general horsemanship that's instilled in you, and you're lobbying on behalf of horsemen. So now what's... I guess currently going on, or what have you been doing for the last couple of years? I mean, it's just amazing what's been going on down in D.C. Well, I think I started lobbying in D.C. in 2015. And at first year, that's how we the lobby started about 10, 15 minute meetings that first year, and we just started increasing them. And I started, I teamed up with uh, Money Herbies from the uh, Animal Wellness um, Action. Um, this year, and we basically lobbied. Well, we did seventy. We did that was seventy-five offices, um, the Senate, Senate, and the uh, the Senate and the House, and we lobbied with uh, Al, Al Handel was with us, um, and Owen Riley, who was the Jockey Club uh, lobbyist, he was with us on all of those meetings, and we just do you know, 14 meetings a day, and so they shut, they really shut Washington D.C. down. How many, total meetings, how, many, how many total meetings do you guys think you did in all that time? Um, for 2020, we did probably about 80 meetings, 80 meetings total. And that was, you know, through, through, through the January through April, I guess, was when they shut down. Would they be committee meetings? Would they be Senate meetings? Like, what different types of levels? I mean, there's probably different levels. Um, there are all types of levels. Where most of the meetings you meet with the staffers are whoever is in charge of the bill um, and, and whoever represents the animal wellness or whatever in the congressman or senator's office. Uh, sometimes you meet with the congressman or the senator, but that's very rare. Um, and it, for the most part, you meet with their different staffers. Now, sometimes you meet with one person. Sometimes you go in there and meet and you meet with five people. Uh, it, it varies from um, who is needed. But uh, we basically had it down. Um, Mar Marty would do the intro, Al would talk, then I would talk, and then Owen would talk, and then we'd do uh, questions and answers. And he needed less than about half an hour. So how long have they been trying to pass this bill that finally got, I guess, put the omnibus and Trump signed and passed to, you know, Mitch McConnell's office? How long did right. it actually get from... I guess, can we say point A to point B with all these different... Twists? They've been trying, trying to get this put through for about eight years. And uh, they were finally did it um, <laughs> this year uh, through McConnell. And you know, McConnell basically uh, stated that um, he, he read an article in the New York Times and that there was not, not the New York Times, Washington Post, that basically stated, you know, is this horse race and obsolete? And that's what really got him to um, jump on board, because previously he was not on board. And so basically, you know, every, everyone's trying to stay in the sports. You know, the sports, was, the, the public perception of our sport right now is, is just awful. Well, yeah, you know, the agribusiness that comes with it is billions of dollars, and people don't understand that. And that's the element that if that disappears, it just hits you know, a different part of the country and the farmers and just everybody. It's just the, the whole agricultural segment. You know, can you delve into the agricultural segment of what you're doing and, you know, the effects that could be detrimental, I guess, to the sport that you're talking about? Um, our, our sport is on life support at this particular point. Our harness racing. And no, but no guys are doing much better. Uh, our sport it doesn't bring in any money. Um, and we have to change that. And we have to be, we have to reinvent our sport. And we have to really get down to the best of both. And we have to fix the problems. And we can't talk about them, we have to fix them. Uh, our races, as currently, are not attracting fans. Uh, the casinos are, not, are losing money on, on our sport. And so we have to change all this around. And we, as a whole industry, have to come together and work together to do this. Uh, we have to change the uh, driving style. The driving style right now is, you know, the single file. And, and look, here comes the favorite on top. Every race is pretty much the same. 
And we have to change that. We have to mix it up. I think we should have some curb races. Uh, I think we should have shorter races, longer races, uh, racing in the opposite direction, uh, too, and a lot of different things just to change the sport around. So it's not the same, same old, same old. Maybe it could move, maybe, you know, with the weather. We were talking about the weather when we first started talking. But, I mean, you know, different times of the year, there's different elements. And if you can move racetracks throughout the country, and these horses, you know, whatever population they are, or maybe they just remain reasonably, but, you know, they can have some grand circuit horses now travel around the country. Right. And, you know, one of the things I saw them doing in Europe, which I thought was really cool, was they were bringing the, the, the track to the public into a city and come take an apart and actually putting the dirt track down about a quarter of a mile long and having a two horse race there. And I thought that was really cool and we should be doing things like that. Um, bring, bring, uh, bring our sport to the, to the people. Or we don't not necessarily do they have to come to us. So here's a, here's a pointed question. And you know, these guys, they spend, I think it was a half a million apiece. The investigation comes out. Do you think more people, you know, of, of any, I guess, sector of the sport should come together and maybe drop 50 or 100,000 into a, a pot and maybe hire a marketing firm, like a professional marketing firm on a multi-year contract for, you know, maybe a couple million dollars a year? And uh, I think we need a lot more than a couple, couple million dollars. Uh, I do think that we need to definitely get the Hamiltonian on national television. And... If we follow what the bill has done, they've already spent the money, they've already put the blueprint out, and if we follow what they have done, um, we can follow them and basically do what they've done for our, for our sport. Um, they've done all the market research, they've done everything. Um, I was reading a lot of this stuff, and a lot of this, their information can be picked up right at the Jockey Books Roundtable meetings, and you can go there, there's a ton of information there. Uh, one of the things that they did in 2011, um, they had the McKinsey report, and the McKinsey report uh, recommended that they do more um, television advertising. They were doing 40 national uh, television events at that time. And so since then, they followed what the McKinsey report had done, and in 2019, they were up to about 700, and I think 20, they went up to drastically a lot more because of the COVID uh, virus. But it, it, it increased their handles and increased their attendance, and they're very happy with that. They're with those results, and so we need to get more national television. Before we delve into your book, let's talk about marketing. I mean, from a simple standpoint, you've seen it all. You've you've done marketing. You've seen it all aspects of marketing. You're you're marketing your show brilliantly now. I mean, everybody listens to it, but you know, what are some of the simple things that we can like quickly talk about where? Do you think we can go back to the simple things like a press release and getting into the newspaper and getting a PSA out, working with local charities, you know, getting in front of local businesses and face-to-face -face and advertising, you know, things like that? Well, one, of the, one of the things in our sport, uh, press releases, when they send out press releases in our sport, they send them to the USDA, and they, that's, a, that's a USDA post them from that's your press release. Um, I like our, our several of our shows, like uh, Marty Irby, um, or just some of the, or a couple of his shows and stuff like that. Uh, he, he said that he sent the shows out to over 6,000 media sources. Um, and it, it didn't just stop at one place. Um, we basically have to start getting back to using the wire lines and stuff and sending out the um, press releases so they go to more audiences rather than just the USDA. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, you know, the USDA does a great job for what they have. Um, they probably need to, their budget for marketing purposes to be about 3 million more. And, you know, they just don't have the money to market properly. Well, there's programs, I mean, these racetracks and casinos should be listening to this. There's programs that they can buy. Um, they're pretty pricey and they're PR related. They hire, a, you know, a PR, I guess, coordinator and then maybe an assistant. You have two people or more on the team and, it can be done. It really can be done. If it's managed correctly, it can be done. And you can just disseminate to certain markets, and you can just watch and scan and track old school. And what about radio? what do you think about radio PSAs, especially like at the fair level? Yes, absolutely. And you know, I go 
back, go back to the marketing. You know, they, uh, the casinos, you know, when they market, you know, you hear, you know, oh, come on out to the uh, Empire Casino. You don't hear anything about come on out to Empire Racetrack. It's uh, Empire Casino. So they're not marketing the uh, harness racing sport. Um, they're marketing the casino. But, uh, we need to, uh, I know Jessica Rowell and uh, Jason Settlemore have been pushing this for a long time. Uh, she's trying to pull 5% of the gaming money that comes into the whole for the whole sport to put into a marketing plan. And um, Jay, Jason's been shot down every time before the USDA board. They won't even, they won't even listen to him. What do you think of this? Okay. In the entertainment industry, they take a percentage of the ring, and the ring is the liquor sales. And if they're not giving away free drinks, the horseman can come and say, you know what, we want a piece of the ring. We want 10%, 20%, 25%. And they can make thousands off that every night. Just off the people that are coming to visit, they can get a piece of the concessions. And they've never, they've never negotiated for that before. And people are bringing the families out. They're spending money there with these high-priced items. Why don't they give a discount back to the horse people in the form of getting a percentage of the ring? If they're bringing people live on track to watch the races and they're there spending money. Yeah. That's a, great idea. that's a great idea. That's a great idea. We need to get someone to negotiate it. Uh, so, so far, you know, I see, I see all these deals, and we, we don't have good negotiated deals. Uh, we're, not getting a, we're not getting the marketing money. Uh, there's no money going into sporting marketing. Um, you know, everyone who is marketing the sport is pretty much doing it on their own signs. And then it's segmented and it's, it's regionalized and it's not on a national scale. But if everybody pulls their money together and they create something, you know, not like self-regulating, this is something that's more of a marketing arm. And Mark Anderson talks about this and everybody talks about this. You know, we need a central, like you're saying even, I'm saying, a central marketing arm where that information is, you know, coming from all the different tracks, but then it's streamlined and mainstreamed for the different markets and segments throughout the country. And if it's seasonal or whatever it is. Yeah, it's a little bit easier for our sport because we're only in 16 states. Uh, we're, we only have primary tourists in the 16 states in that territory. But what about, you know, promoting on an international scale? And when the, the weather moves and the weather's nice, like I said, the Grand Circuit horses follow that schedule. When they could be racing from March to September or October. And people will be traveling in throughout the country. You hook up with these, you know, state tourism bureaus and, you know, regional tourism bureaus and even national ones where you're promoting tourism. And you're getting the, you know, you're getting Anthony McDonald involved now with fractional ownership. Yeah. Uh, Anthony was on our show uh, about a year ago, I guess it was. Uh, he, he did a great job. You, you know, what do you think about fractional ownership as the future of the sport? Uh, fractional ownership is a, is a great idea. It's um, I think um, Joy um, McReynolds, who used to be Joy um, or Gemma, uh, she owned part of the, uh, what's that, what, what, what's that, what, what, um, oh, I can't think of the horse's name right now, the one that can help you there be last year. Uh, she, I think she owned, like, one of the one of 4,500 owners of the horse. <laughs> so. But, you know, the point that we're, we're getting at here is if fractional ownership is the future of the sport, and they start drawing people to the tracks again, people are going to notice. They're going to be spending money. They're going to be staying, you know, staying in hotels. They're going to be buying gas. It's going to boost tourism. It's going to boost taxes. It's going to be noticed. You're right. And I think, I think Anthony McDonald, getting back to him, I think the last time I spoke to him, he had 700 owners yeah. on, the, on the fractional owners. And, you know, and, and someone could own 1% of a book. They could own 25%. They could own 50%. Amazing, and you know, I thought you said 30 countries. We had a little typo. It was actually 13 countries. Can you imagine? He said in our interview, you know, if I can, if I can continue to be doing what I was doing, you know, I don't know where I'd be at right now. He goes, it's just so easy for me to walk in and sell this because it's so simple and so easy. He's done a great job. I remember when he started. You know, and when he started with the professional owners, 
a boat. And it's, it was, there's a lot of um, copycat stuff there right now, but I'm copying what he did. Uh, but I think he's the most successful at, at the professional ownership. So, you know, he's basically does parties and he has people, um, I think at the Hamiltonian, I think he had a uh, party going there for, uh, and not this year, not this year, but the year before. I think he had a private party going up there for his owners. I would have it, but yes. But, you know, he's drawing a crowd and they're spending thousands of dollars, don't you think? You know, 10 or 20 percent of those concessions should go back to the horsemen to their accounts? You would think so. Okay. And that's never been, you know, negotiated, it's never been thought of, but if, you know, you have high end box seats and you have high end this and you got to get tickets for that and they're spending, you know, a couple hundred a person, there's five of them or ten of them in a group. Yeah. Uh, and if you go back to Roosevelt Raceway, uh, when uh, Roosevelt, you know, they made money on the parking, they made money on the programs, they made money on the admissions, um, they made money on the concessions. On the concessions. What's the handle on that? The pencils, the shoe shines, the ice cream. Yeah. Think about it. Uh, they, they, you know, I think Stevens had the contract at that time for the food concessions, and, you know, he had to pay them, I think, was, I think he had to pay them 10% of whatever, you know, the profits were. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about the book now. You, 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 have, you have a great relationship with, you know, the, the great Houghton family. You wrote a book with one of the Houghtons. Let's talk about the book now. 2014, you guys wrote a book. Yep. Uh, that book is probably the best-selling um, harness racing book that I, I think I just sold more copies than any other harness racing book. Uh, we have the uh, state publishing uh, company that um, they're out of business at this particular point, and um, I have it reprinted now up on Amazon. But uh, the book is available there, and we spent uh, a year writing that book uh, with Vicky Howard, uh, Billy Howard Jr., and myself and Vicky Howard. Um, we have a lot, a lot of good stories in there, and a lot of the uh, stories that take to uh, you know, write the book with both from the uh, New York Times and the Long Island Press and a lot of the different papers and so forth. And, you know, Billy and myself were there. I uh, think he was not an officer or something or something, but um, Billy and myself, we grew up there, and, you know, we've known each other since we were kids. And we also had a CC lady for some love put a nice little comment in the book there, and we make known to the and we all come up with each other. Well, and it's all multi-generational, from your parents and grandparents and... Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, the book was a lot of fun, it was a lot of fun, and still, well, I still get a lot of questions about the book, and it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add before we ask you for some special shout-outs to anybody that's helped you over the years? Like, anything else you want to tell us about? Any other stories? Um, I'll tell us about the story real quick. Uh, I had four horses in the race with the Meadowlands, and uh, all four horses can win. I uh, saw so Joey Bonera. Okay, so, so Joey, so Joey's betting the horses. And so my dad's down to drive the horses, and my dad doesn't show up. He's uh, sick or whatever. So I have four horses in at the metal and all four can win. So I go over to uh, Eddie Wing. First time I ever really met Eddie Wing, this was in 1976. I go, Eddie, I got four horses in tonight. They can all win. Uh, you want to drive them? He said, well, I got to meet my wife for her dinner at the sixth race. He said, well, I'll drive the, one, one, the early one. <laughs> so slow down on that one. And so, um, and then I got, I found, um, I had Roy Gilmore drive one, I think Buddy Gilmore drove one, and Jimmy Holman drove the other wow. one. So I have four different drivers now driving the horses. Wow. So Teddy, Teddy, Teddy wins, wins the first one. And as soon as you hang, you're hanging the lines up, he looks and says, are those other three still available? I said, no. <laughs> they're still wow. And so the next one was a horse called uh, Final Flight, and she was owned by Stan Burstein. And so uh, she won. And she paid forty some odd dollars. The other one that paid like twelve dollars. And then the next one was a trotter that was in the and he was down in the he was an open trotter. He missed by a nose. And then the last one was a one of the three year old Billy. And um, she wanted to pay like eighteen dollars. So so Joey Joey was up there in the grandstand. And so he's like, 
Thank you. Thank you. Anything you need from us, you got. Thanks again.